Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, our dear colleague, Martin Prominski, Dean of the Faculty of Architecture and Landscape at Leibniz University in Hanover, uh, who will um, um, try to sharpen our um, perception on design and research through design. You're welcome. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction and also for the invitation. Dear colleagues, good morning. Um, I have to say I feel a bit shy after yesterday's two keynote lectures. Uh, I will not present a design for the whole world, and I will not uh, address actually the grand challenges. I will only deal with one of our uh, methods, with it, which is research through design in landscape architecture. But I hope I can create a little bit of interest in that. Instead of an outline, I will present some hypotheses, maybe also in preparation for a discussion afterwards. First, designing is the core method in landscape architecture. Second, designing is rarely harnessed as a component of knowledge production in research. Third, designing is traditionally seen as unscientific. Four, designing is a special approach to knowledge production. Five, designing should be integrated into a nonlinear interplay with other methods to unfold its potential in research. It cannot stand alone. And six, Designing has a particular relevance in landscape architecture for PhDs and transdisciplinary research facing the challenges of the Anthropocene. Those are my hypotheses for the beginning. I want to start with showing some projects which we admire a lot. I will show uh, examples from the Rosa Barber Award Maybe the, what the Pritzker Prize is in architecture, I would say is the Rosa Barber Award in landscape architecture. It's given every two years at the Barcelona Biennial. Last one was uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Michael van Falkenberg. This is the design, and this is a realized uh, project. The one before was quite different, uh, the Saxhole Crater Stairway from Landslag EHF, Brian Hauxon, very minimalistic design drawing here, uh, and a very minimalistic design. It's a staircase towards a crater. Or Marty French's beautiful restoration project, Cap de Creuse Natural Park. Here's a plan, or the design, whatever you call it. And uh, he was really able, in a poetic way, to, to uh, integrate existing situations into uh, functional other issues. Or here, 2003, a uh, rather common uh, topic for us, a botanical garden, this one by Katrin Mosbach in Bordeaux. Here the design and the realized uh, object. And the first uh, Rosa Barber Award went to Landscape Park Duisburg North with this yeah, quite strategic design plan and this yeah, really successful uh, built design. So these are the projects that we maybe admire most in, in landscape architecture. That's the reason why they got awards. And they are designs. So I think designing is really our core method. Um, Otherwise, we would not award those projects. And, and I guess each of you, if one of your graduates would win the Rosa Barber Award, you would be really proud. The question is, is designing an acceptable research method? I learned uh, or I grew up in the environment of Technical University of Berlin. I studied there in the early 90s. After two years at the GSD, I came back to do my PhD. And in Germany, when you do a PhD, you also teach studios. And um, 
in, in studios, I, I got um, a lot of discussions with the students because our theory teacher was Ulrich Eisel. And he wrote a seminal text which all students read. And there he differentiated between two things. Landscape architecture, which he said is by principle non-scientific. He defined habitus types for the different uh, yeah, directions. And habitus type of landscape architects is trust in imagination. He said it's subjective, it's always specific, and therefore it cannot be scientific. In contrast, he said landscape planning can be scientific, it has the habitus type of instrumental rationality. And this is what the students believed. Uh, I really didn't believe in it, in this sharp differentiation. In fact, I think design and planning are not so much different, uh, if at all. I think uh, you, could, you could say designing, you design always, it's different scales, and on each scale you have different demands. Um, anyway, so when I went into uh, a desk grid, then the students told me, if I gave a critique, they said, well, it's my design, it's my idea, it's subjective, it's my intuition, what, what do you want to tell me? So I, I had a big skepticism about that, and I, in, in my uh, PhD, uh, I, I had first ideas how to counter this. Uh, one guy who helped me a lot was Donald Schön, with his wonderful book, The Reflective Practitioner, in which he uh, developed uh, uh, um, an epistemology of the design process and uh, yeah, convinced me that there's a, a mixture between rationality and intuition, and they both always work together. So there's a, a specific um, yeah, rationality in design. Um, and because it has this special uh, type of knowledge uh, uh, production, um, it is able to address the uh, the messy problems, the complex pro uh, problems, those who have value conflicts, who have uncertainty, and therefore they can, uh, they are different to science, which always has a distance to be objective. So this will uh, become important uh, later. A second guy who, who helped me was uh, Christopher Frailing. In the UK, Already in the 90s, um, universities uh, or art universities, design schools, um, had to justify what they are doing uh, or, or that they are at a university. Yeah? So Freiling uh, wrote the first paper uh, trying to yeah, integrate designing or art um, into the academic world in his famous uh, paper, Research in Art and Design, from 93. And he proposed the trinities of design research. Research about design, research for design, research through design, in three columns. He said, we have research about design. This is if you reflect existing work, um, and, and um, so history, critique, theory, um, very important works have been done for landscape architecture by research about design. However, it operates from without designing. Uh, it has a distance to design. The same is true for research for design. It, it, that's the knowledge we, we need in designing. We need knowledge about roof gardening. We need software. We need methods for, uh, for doing interviews uh, and so on. But still, the design process is not involved. Only in the third column, research through design, there, designing is the essential component of the research. The research would not work without the design process. The problem of the trinities was, for, for, for many years, or maybe it still is, that it separates those three directions. And if I was really looking for some examples of research through design in those many papers that were written by the design theorists, but I hardly found any. And if, you, if we come back to a design, here, here's the one by Michael van Falkenberg, 
And if you assess it um, uh, in regard to the established research criteria, it is obvious that one design or a design can never fulfill scientific criteria. I take criteria here from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. In a way, they are all over the world the same, and they are, they, they are valid for uh, social science, natural science, whatever, those that I've written down here. Um, does this design address a research question? Of course not. No design really has to address a research question. Why? Um, does the designer have to explain the relevance within the research context? Well, I think he sets, each design is uh, building up on precedents, on ideas, on theory, of course, but uh, in design itself, you don't have to make this transparent. But in, if you do research, you have to make transparent where your ideas come from, where it, it sits in relation to it. Number three, yes, uh, if designing is a research method, of course, then this criteria is fulfilled. But the last one is maybe the most difficult one. Explain the impact on other researchers and the potential opportunities to transfer the knowledge into new contexts. I mean, why should Michael van Falkenberg write something to explain why this could be important for other river uh, bank projects? Maybe it would be even counterproductive for him to do that. In the office, there, will be, there is this knowledge. But uh, he's not doing research. So, in the end, summary, uh, a single design can never be research. So, the, that, that made me uh, thought a lot. And uh, on my last sabbatical, I had some time to, to dig a little bit deeper. And together with Hille von Segan, I published uh, this book, Design Research for Urban Landscapes. We were reflecting particularly on PhDs, on PhDs that we supervised, and also we invited uh, some others, uh, for example, the one by Karin Helms, who is sitting here, uh, in the book. And we only included PhDs which uh, had uh, designing as part of the knowledge production. And in my chapter, I uh, tried to develop uh, yeah, a theory of this, and I came up that um, the, that research through designing consists of different moments which interplay in a nonlinear way. I have original moments, uh, reflective moments, uh, transfer moments, uh, empty moments, and um, so here, this is the core of our uh, approach in landscape architecture, each design is a projection. That makes it also so difficult uh, from a scientific point of view because it's a projection. It's not there. It's really hard to assess objectively. Um, tr sorry. Um, transfer moments include research for design mom uh, moments because if you uh, are able to develop knowledge which is relevant for others beyond uh, you as a researcher, um, you, you, yeah, then it is relevant for future designs. So research for design. And reflective moments, they include elements of research about design because in, in research you have to reflect the context of previous research and so on. Um, and I wanted to check if, 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 if I follow, or if we follow this path, integrating different moments, including the designing, if this fulfills the research criteria. So, there have to be those original moments asking, is this research, is this PhD addressing something new? Does it have originality? That's mandatory. And that, those are the original moments. The reflective moments, they address the relevance within the research context. Um, of course, the central method in research through designing is designing, but 
usually each uh, research or PhD also integrates many more methods. But if it's research through designing, designing should be the core method. And you need those transfer moments to, uh, yeah, this always comes at the end of the research where you try to summarize or abstract how it is relevant uh, for other researchers in the future. So with those uh, moments, um, you could address all those research criteria which would also apply for, say, physics. I want to show you two examples now. One PhD, which follows this concept, and one uh, research project. Many PhD candidates are shy to integrate designing because of this prejudice that it is non-scientific yeah, and rather go the safe way of research for design or research about design in Freling's language. I don't think this is necessary. And here we have an example by Anke Schmidt. She did her PhD at our university uh, as a part-timer and she had an office with her other um, position. Um, and in her office, um, she had a lot of projects dealing with large-scale design, also involving people. And, so, and she already used some narrative formats, and she, with her PhDs, she wanted to find out more about this. So it's called Urban Landscape Stories, Narrative Formats for Collaborative Design Processes. And her research questions addressed her interest. She wanted to know the potentials of storytelling for urban landscape design and design research, and how can narrative strategies support collaborative design and design research processes. So those were the original moments. She had a very nice concept drawing of her PhD, where these other moments are clearly visible. She uh, had uh, the theory part, which, which are the reflective moments, and she had five case studies from uh, her office and other work, but it was all her own design work. And this was set into relation with the theory, and in the end, uh, she had transfer moments, and she developed narrative formats, which future designers could use if they want, uh, if, if they are interested in, in, in narrative formats for collaborative urban landscape design. Um, to show you the, the, the designing, parts of the design, just one example here, she, she was involved in a project um, to um, design scenarios for the Altes Land. This is a fruit growing um, area west of Hamburg. Uh, which, has, which is under many threats, also because of climate change and digging of the River Elbe for, for, for container ships so that they can enter the harbor, which would uh, change the whole um, water table and so on. So there are many problems or challenges here for, for this landscape. And uh, she designed several scenarios. This is one, an efficient biotech land, and the design used uh, some of the narrative formats which she developed. She called this format landscape protagonists plus spatial po uh, portrait. She kind of designed or invented people who could uh, act in this future landscape or in this scenario that she develops. So there was a back and forth between uh, yeah, people and, um, and the landscape. And she, she did three scenarios. The second one just here uh, to show the difference. Uh, it's completely different landscape, but also she, uh, because she was able to uh, yeah, develop also different landscape protagonists. So, and in the end, there were these uh, transfer moments with those narrative formats. Uh, I don't uh, read all them. I just want to show that she really was able to draw from all these different designs in which she developed in a reflective process those transferable um, yeah, formats. 
And then um, it is really, it just fulfills all those criteria. And at the moment, you see at many uh, schools a development that they want to start uh, practice-based PhDs as kind of uh, side street of PhDs because they think um, yeah, designing is so special, we need a special type of PhDs. I think this is counterproductive, if not even dangerous, to do that because then we are put on the site in the scientific community, in my opinion, which is absolutely not necessary. Yeah? We, we, we should be really self-confident about our method, but it has to be integrated in a larger context. So I switched to uh, a research project. Um, so I, I was really, for a long time, trying to get third-party funded research in which uh, designing could be uh, yeah, done, right? And, and luckily, uh, two years ago, um, I, was, I could become a member of a large transdisciplinary project called Good Coast Lower Saxony. Hanover is uh, in the federal state of Lower Saxony. And um, three of the major uh, water engineers of our uh, universities, they came together and um, yeah, won this uh, project. It has a five million euro budget. It takes five years. Um, and there's those three universities with seven institutes and 25 researchers. Me, for example, I have two PhD candidates within this uh, project. Um, and um, it, it is transdisciplinary because we involve a lot of um, yeah, actors and stakeholders from the society. And, and we are labeling ourselves as real-world laboratories for ecosystem strengthening coastal protection on the coast of Lower Saxony. The one thing about transdisciplinary research is that you are working in real-world laboratories or in some countries, especially in Scandinavia, I think it's more uh, living labs is used for that. I don't think there's a big difference. But you are working on real sites with real people together. And we have those three real-world laboratory sites. And one is the island of Spiekeroog, um, which I will uh, address later on. Um, the project setup is uh, complex. You don't have to read all this. But it shows the big difference of uh, interdisciplinary research and transdisciplinary research. An interdisciplinary research would only work on this side. You have different disciplines here. So landscape architecture is one of them. Uh, and you work together in a science team. In transdisciplinary research, you have real-world laboratory sites and you have the uh, uh, local stakeholders, actors. And we all work together. And in the ideal case, there's co-design, co-production, and co-evaluation of the knowledge. Co-design, in this case, means even the research setup uh, is designed cooperatively between the stakeholders and the scientists. Some, this is something people are, or, or uh, some scientists are really skeptical about, to integrate uh, yeah, non-scientists even in the research uh, set up. But um, yeah, so co-production of knowledge and also in the end co-evaluation. Um, so this is our setup. And uh, I have to admit, we are really a junior partner in this uh, team. We are in the very bottom right here. Um, and the principal investigators are all these coastal engineers. And um, Maybe I, they thought in the beginning, OK, let's try those landscape architects. Uh, in the end, at least they can make things nice. But uh, in the first two years already, they discovered uh, that we have some more abilities. Um, yeah, um, Because uh, our task is, in the end, uh, there, there should be um, design scenarios. And our, we have to do, we design those future spatial visions 
um, and the evaluation of their specific socio-ecological impacts and in a co-design with the local actors. Uh, this is one of those uh, real-world sites, wonderful island of uh, Spiekeroog. And what we always do uh, in Hanover, we try to integrate our students in the research work. So we had uh, by, by now uh, two design studios uh, in the master, and we did something which we have to do in year four and five, where we are not yet, but we tested with the students already what, could, what is possible in terms of scenarios. So the databases is not as profound as it will be in the end, but we were surprised how much you could already see and test. We had those other disciplines uh, supporting us in, in, in crits, so they came and, and advised the students already. And just to show you some we had, uh, examples, we had uh, two groups, uh, four groups. Um, here's one group who, who had uh, four different scenarios. One scenario here even um, assumed a five meter sea level rise, uh, which is uh, in Germany by most people seen as completely unrealistic at the moment. Our national government uh, is calculating with the sea level rise, I think, of 83 centimeters until the year 2100. I don't believe this anymore. Um, but of course, uh, this uh, design uh, showed how many changes uh, the island have to undergo um, in order to, to, to have still people there. Uh, and it was a bit shocking also for, for the uh, locals. Um, but that's, that's the quality of those uh, scenarios. Just to show you a different approach, this group here uh, focused a lot on the relations between the humans and the non-humans on, on this uh, island. And we were able to uh, exhibit the, those results on the island in the National Park House. It's still hanging there, and we get a lot of uh, feedback um, already on this uh, student work, which also will help us uh, later on to do our scenario work. Um, so let me do this one more time. Yeah, evaluate, um, evaluate it. Is it proper research, what we are doing, right? Where we had a common research question, it's a compromise. I'm not very happy with it, to be honest. Uh, there are some words which could be debated, but it will take more cooperation work to convince that maybe harmony with nature is uh, yeah, debatable anyway. But we had a research question, <laughs> of course. Um, well, we have to reflect, of course, a lot. I mean, in our team, we reflect, uh, of course, everything which is written about uh, coastal uh, design, uh, design scenarios or, or effects uh, on, on, on the coasts by sea level rise. Um, and we also need to reflect the, the, the knowledge which is produced by our disciplinary colleagues. For example, we have people who are working with some artificial mats uh, or which support the growth of uh, salt marshes when the sea level is rising, right? Uh, we have our social scientists who are doing interviews. We have uh, people who are experts in those um, subwater processes in, in the uh, sea. Or we have people who, who are dealing with more biodiverse dike vegetation. Eh? And all this has to be integrated in the, um, in the final scenarios. Um, and this is exactly then our quality. I mean... What, what they do is all very interesting, but it is very specific and special. And if you work together with local people, uh, it is, I think, too far away from them. But if you are able to integrate it in a spatial scenario which they can connect to, then you, you get them much more. Yeah? And, and this is the unique quality of us as designers, that we can do that. So... Um, 
I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to do that. We were also affected by COVID. There's nothing worse for a transdisciplinary project if you can't get to know the people directly. It really doesn't work on, on Zoom. Um, and that yeah, took us yeah, almost one and a half years to get over that. But now it's getting better. Um, we are not there at producing the transfer moments, but we will do it uh, just to what could it be, a very old transferable knowledge uh, by the IPCC who had those, let's call them design guidelines, very simple ones. Of course, we try to develop uh, yeah, more advanced ones. Uh, we will see. But uh, of course, this is our goal in the project. So let me conclude. Um, Designing and design research should be embedded in a larger interplay of other methodological moments in order to fulfill the criteria of established research. Yeah, it cannot stand alone. If you do it, uh, it has a unique potential to synthesize different strands of disciplinary knowledge into complex spatial projections. And I hope I, I could show that it really has a high value within PhDs and particularly in transdisciplinary research projects. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope there are some questions. Oh, Kai. <laughs> Martin, that was very, very fine and very, very useful. I'd like to ask two questions to test your classification. You used the Rosa Barber prizes as a straw man for making your argument, which is a very compelling one. And you cited them because they were built. Yet the two examples you gave in your presentation, the first one ended in the overlap diagram of what amounted to rules based on the experience of the person who made the thesis. It did not end in a single solution recommended. The second one represented alternatives and also did not end with a recommendation that could be built, thus potentially being a candidate for the Rosa Barber Prize. Does the design process in your third right-hand category require a buildable design to come out at the front end, at the back end, rather, of the research? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. Well, um... Uh, let me ask my second question. Uh, before I forget I, it, I will forget it. Uh, so please give, let me try the answer. My second question is this. If you, could figure out, if you could figure out the rules, which is the basis for transfer, mm -hmm. I believe that a computer program using AI could make the design. Especially the design in your second example. Mm -hmm. and the question then is, would a student qualify for a PhD if they made a design through artificial intelligence? Okay, two very sharp questions. Uh, I don't think uh, AI will be able to do those scenarios because... I think you're wrong on that. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I think this is uh, addressing also a topic we had yesterday. I think um, if you... If you integrate um, all these social aspects into the scenarios where you need contact to the people, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical if uh, AI is able to integrate all that. Well, let's, we'll find that out in the next generation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I believe AI can deal with human beings directly. But 
The last step is the crucial question. Right. Um, well, the last step in, 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 in what I propose here is uh, after you have designed uh, in your research, in your PhD, you try to summarize this and abstract it a little bit to advance, I would say, designing, right? So, um, and hopefully other designers who are not researchers, but who read this, uh, develop more uh, or better designs, right? And hopefully win the Rosa Barba Award. Um, but you haven't demonstrated that in the second one. All you've said is there are many ways to solve the problem. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I don't think that um, you need, in the end, in, in this type of research, I mean, you, the, the, that moves it into the second group, not into the third group. What you're doing is you're saying there's a process that ends up with alternatives. Yeah. It moves that third category, which is the basis of the argument, into the second category. You mean the about design? As I said, first, I would say that it is a nonlinear interplay and it moves, and, but you do designs which have not existed before, which are only done within your research frame, started with the research question, then you do the design, and they, then they become designs and are reflected and go back to the transfer moments. Uh, okay, I, I don't, I'm, I, I, uh, newness is not interesting uh, um, to me, uh, it just should convince, right? I mean, yeah? um, but I think what, what, I, what I present here is really simple, yeah? but uh, for me it took a long time just to discover this and to put it into an order, but in a, just framing it uh, is, is really a simple thing, but I, it took me so long to overcome the trinities of frailing, to be honest, to understand this, that I'm quite happy with this simple result. Enough. Okay, more, more questions. <laughs> Martin, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, it was very inspiring to, to watch. Um, and it would be fun to go into a deeper discussion. Um, I have a, a bit of a specific question because we had the opportunity and the pleasure together with the team of Anna Kujan with the Tomas Pipan for example to work on the three-year research project trying to do kind of the same thing we used students projects mm -hmm. um, and incorporate them into a transdisciplinary research based on transformation of um, alpine industrial landscapes a little bit of a different issue and we constantly ran into a, a bit of a problem and, and I wonder how you dealt with this, because you were also talking about scenarios. Mm -hmm. Now for me, scenario technique has a different aim. In scenarios, you're sort of trying to control the parameters very much in order to come up with different outcomes, but you are sort of changing the parameters. And we had big trouble because everybody was asking the project for the scenarios to say, no, it's not about scenarios. It's about um, test, about designing different alternatives. That's what Karl Steinitz said. And the difference between scenarios and alternatives, I think there might be a key to also this research questions. Because if you go into the scenario technique, you're beginning to very scientifically control the parameters. But this is not the strength of design from my point of view. Of course, Scenario techniques is a different story, but the question, well, it's a question and maybe also a recommendation for your project to sort of be careful to really use the power of design, which is focusing on alternatives and not on scenarios. Mm -hmm. That's my belief, but I don't know if, if you, you stumbled across that. Because, and in the end, it was also extremely difficult, Manza can also uh, witness that, to tell our customers, which were the people living out there, it's not about finding the best solution. No, they were always asking for what's the best solution. They said, there is no best solution. We're trying to find the ingredients, the criteria for a good solution. 
This does not mean, and they were completely frustrated, of course, because they said, hey, we want to see the best design. Mm. They thought we would present them the Rosa Barber Prize for their project in the end, and we said, this is not the aim of our research. The design is simply there to incorporate or to generate knowledge, and that's why I have my, that's why I strongly believe in with design we can generate knowledge mm -hmm. that we do not, we're not able to generate with other methods. If you tell me another method, Carl, how we can generate that knowledge, I'm willing to give up the design and say, let's do something better, you know? It's because we're not, we're not doing this uh, for wasting time, we're doing this for solving problems. And one of the problems, from my point of view, in today's landscape architecture and urban planning, global planning, is the human, the so-called human, I hate that term, the so-called human factor, which is something super uncalculable. Mm -hmm. And design has, from my point of view, the strength to exactly incorporate this kind of human factor into the discussion in a very, I think, nice way, but takes a while. But I don't know if you, or did you use the term scenario Mm -hmm. we see right here, um, deliberately, or how did you deal with this situation? So just to, 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 to get it clear, so you make a, a big difference between alternatives or scenarios? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Because scenarios for me, I know that's my understanding, scenario says we're changing certain parameters, and this is sort of mm -hmm. showing us the same situation with different parameters, whereas alternatives say too many things can change mm -hmm. constantly, parallel, yeah, yeah. and it's not about parameters control, but it's about showing different possible futures, mm -hmm. so to say. Yeah, yeah, alternative futures, this is what Carl will probably mention, and he has done that also uh, a lot. Um, and um, yes, if you really uh, stick to the strict definition of scenarios, you are, you are right, and I... You, you, I, I could also label this uh, alternatives. I, I would not be too, I, I, I maybe not, was not too precise in using uh, the word scenario. And, and for, for our uh, research project here, we will also not be able to develop the optim, most optimized uh, solution, but rather go in, into the discussion with uh, those alternatives, right? Um, but as this, 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 what the students already did, no other discipline could do that. And it raised already so many future debates. And, and of course, uh, we, we, and we are able to include the non-human factors, which is an even worse word uh, or term uh, also, yeah? Which, yeah, which, yeah. Okay, I had uh, two points, if this on. One is on a lighter note about intuition in terms of design. Uh, the well-known uh, Italian architect and engineer Pier Luigi, Pier Luigi Nervi was lecturing at Columbia University talking about his work. He does large span uh, concrete shells and whatever, and this was before the computer. And uh, the students asked him how they were calculating these structures, and he said, well, you know, it's beyond, they're indeterminate structures, and we actually design primarily by intuition. Uh, so the next day, the students were circulating a petition saying we shouldn't have structures courses, engineering courses anymore, because if uh, intuition is good enough for Nervi, it should be good enough for us. And they asked him to sign their petition to uh, reinforce their ideas. And he said, oh, no, 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 you, you don't understand. He said, my intuition is based on 40 years of experience and study. And so I think that's, that's part of the design process as well, which isn't factored in very often, is how experienced is the designer? Mm -hmm. uh, the main point was your last transfer uh, moment, whatever it was called. I wondered whether that needed to be done by the design person, him or herself. I mean, for example, if someone writes an article about the project, it's disseminating that knowledge. If there's post-evaluation, uh, uh, what do they call it? Post occupancy evaluations. Isn't that a way of transferring information itself? And the last thing I wonder, because most of the times when you have these, all these process things people are supposed to follow, there's normally a feedback option, you know, which is how do you look at, the, even for the designer, how do you look at the, what has been done 
and see what can be learned in terms of doing it for the next, that it's an, an evolving process mm. rather than a, a linear one. Mm. <clears throat> well, why should someone else reflect on the other designs if you are a PhD candidate or if you are in a research project? It could, right. And this is the traditional research about design, that others reflect about designs by others. It's, it's okay, but uh, I think there's a really great opportunity if uh, the designers themselves can do that. That would be my answer to one of your questions. The other question um, relates a little bit to, to Donald Schön. When he has this relation of uh, rationality and intuition, he speaks uh, that each designer has uh, her or his um, appreciative system, which develops like Nervi over 40 years. Uh, so when I lecture about it, when students ask, hmm, how old do I have to get before I uh, become a, a good designer? I, I always have, in the end of this lecture, uh, the Vietnam Memorial Competition showing uh, uh, Maya Lin, very shy, standing in front of her uh, successful design. So I, I tell them it is possible, even in a very early stage, that you can do an excellent design. Yeah? Um, that, uh, but of course, a developed appreciative system uh, helps. Thanks very much for this interesting presentation. I would be highly interested um, in this aspect of co-evaluating designs, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the centerpieces of this transdisciplinary process that you've illustrated, I think, besides co-designing and co-building of knowledge for this Good Coast project. Um, you, we've seen that you um, yeah, put the, the final designs in this national park house um, and, and I would be interested how do potential feedback loops look like and how uh, is the opinion in this co-evaluation process used for um, refining the existing designs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question that we also still have because we are just getting out of the COVID problem and we still have until the end of 24. And this co-evaluation phase, um, we have not conceptualized it, to be, to be honest, at the moment, because we are slowly intensifying again our contacts to, to those uh, stakeholders. Um, it, it will be really a challenge. And, um, and, um, and this is the ideal conception, and we are also not sure at the moment how, how well we are able to, to do this final step of co-evaluation. I hope I can give you an answer in 25. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. We follow Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, to provide us with another set of insights and I really appreciate that at this conference we really start talking about research through design and landscape architecture. I think this is a first point in time that we look into the mirror, that we really start to, to critically discuss it. <clears throat> and I really uh, very much enjoy to do this. And um, I really appreciate the, your, your approach. I have two little questions. Mm. One is about your last slide not the very last slide, but the methodological moments. Mm -hmm. That was a kind of new term occur occurring in your talk. Um, and I would be interested, what are the methodological moments for you? Because you give some recommendations for PhD uh, projects, and I think the PhDs would be very interested. What does he mean with that? Mm -hmm. Is it the only question? That is one question, okay. and then another small one afterwards. Okay. It took me yeah, quite a while to yeah, decide on the correct word, and since I'm not a native speaker, I'm even not sure if moments is the best word. Uh, but I used moments instead of, say, uh, uh, methods, uh, because uh, I want to address this, uh, yeah, 
complexity and non-linearity because they pop up always. Yeah? So it could be that once you are uh, uh, in the transfer moment stage that you find out that maybe your uh, research question was wrong. So you might go back to the beginning, right? So therefore I use moments and those um, um, yeah, moments include yeah, methodological steps. I, I, it was very useful, uh, our workshop yesterday, to see how you at Wageningen um, are trying to, to, to integrate all these other methods. But, um, and this is, um, uh, of course, very important. But I would now, I think we at, uh, in landscape architecture are now at a moment where we should really uh, be confident to include this designing method uh, into the research. So for me, this is on top. This is on top. Therefore, I call those projective moments uh, here as a single issue. And, and, uh, but of course, um, like you do it, you have to include uh, other methods uh, uh, for, from other disciplines even to, to, to create a convincing work uh, in the end. But I, I like the word uh, moments because it's uh, yeah, so momentarily, yeah? so it's situational. Yeah. Um, I think we can all relate to the non-linearity of creative processes in general yeah. because the scientists have the same they have the same... In the end, uh, yes. Yes. They, 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 they phrase a problem and then they come up with a hypothesis to explain it or the engineer is a solution and then they That's return it. like, oh, damn. But it, they usually hide it, huh? No. No? But okay. Luckily, there's also now a journal for all the failed uh, experiments because this is extremely important knowledge that, because we all want to learn from that. So uh, uh. Anyway, but my second question is about um, the framework for, for research that you chose that, that was from the British uh, Research Council. Yeah. And of course, there, there are different frameworks. I'm just curious why you chose that specific one. Yeah, for, for reasons of uh, time, I, I, in, if I have more time for lectures, uh, I include also the German uh, um, list, um, which is slightly different from the DFG, the Deutsche uh, German Research Foundation, where all researchers submit their proposals from mathematics to all disciplines, and they're all the same criteria. Um, we also, if we submit a proposal, we have to fulfill them, and in the end, they're quite similar. So I think this is uh, what I had here from the Arts and Humanities Research Council is, is a good... Uh, yeah, uh, common summary of, of research criteria. Richard is not convinced, but uh, yeah, we would, we would have to see. But uh, I, I think, um, yeah, it, co it collects the most important things, I think. Yeah. Karin? Uh, so it's not exactly a question, it's just a um, testimony. And maybe it comes back to the first question. Do these practice-based PhD serve our landscape? Are they really constructed or not? Or is it only reflections, scenarios, or other wordings that we can find? I can just tell my own experience. I was 20 years state advisor in France, worked uh, with locals for local government, mm. and did a PhD linked to Upper Normandy, where this cultural landscape, something called Clomazur, is a uh, Landbill here in, in Danish, uh, and they are on the way to vanish. So, how to construct their cultural landscape of tomorrow and with uh, uh, stakeholders, but mainly with farmers. So, the mm. whole issue was to find methods to understand the past and the present and imagine their future, uh, to give them a frame to do it because they are their landowners. They are, have the tools, I don't have it, I cannot build it for them, but it was working with them and find the frame for it. This means also, if you zoom out, it was through scale, today we was in a conference about scale, how to make it so that it is not just at the plot of one farm, but also for the whole mm -hmm. upper Normandy, this uh, Korean. So it was with them, for them, 
and uh, it is under construction. So it does work. You can have PhDs who help them to give them, enable them to work on their construction of their cultural landscape. They are planting today uh, wind hedgerows uh, to help them against uh, heavy wind, against uh, erosion. So I think that PhD can serve uh, mm. our cultural landscapes. Yeah. So it's just a small testament. But uh, yeah, practice-based PhDs, um, I, I've, I've been to uh, one of their meetings and I saw a lot of presentations and most presentations ended more in a personal therapeutic uh, reflection of own work, which was not really interesting for anyone else. And this cannot be a PhD in my view. So, so um, and I, 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 my uh, uh, position now is why doing this extra thing practice-based? I mean, each discipline has its practice, right? So why are we trying to develop a kind of strange path uh, when we could just, um, yeah, stay within the family in a way. Well, I mean, we, we are not, we are, we are for a long time seen as outsiders. I don't know in what, which environments you grow up, uh, like me and with Ulrich Eisel. Yeah? I had to fight very long to understand or, or oppose this opinion that uh, landscape architecture is not part of, of, of uh, uh, academia in a way. Thank you. This would be good words to conclude. Unfortunately, we have to conclude this very interesting uh, debate. Yeah. Well, I, I do believe uh, design has a research value in itself, and we are probably um, are forced to look into these directions one way or another. I mean, using methods and framing it in larger research context. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Thank you all for a constructive debate.